I've got a home.
Amen. Everyone take two minutes to meet those around you. We'll be getting back started. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, I hear myself. Awesome. Could we start bringing it together, guys? I know you would love to fellowship, but we are going to continue. Uh, but just to lead into our next song, we are going to just read a scripture in Revelation. And the scripture just really talks about heaven and how when we get to heaven, we're just going to be worshiping. And ultimately, right now, this is a tiny piece of heaven. So if you guys want to turn with me. Or if you just want to listen, it's going to be in Revelation 7, verse 9. And it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. <laughs> and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. So just meditate on the scripture as we lead into our next song and just worship God with all you have. And just taste this tiny piece of heaven that you get to feel right now. Amen.
Hello, hello. Buenos dias. Uh, please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Um, it's good to be home. Uh, my name is uh, Martin or Martin uh, Chaires. Uh, my wife and I, Tina and I, we uh, have the privilege of serving uh, the last three years. <coughs> Uh, one of our Spanish ministries here in the coastal L.A. Uh, region, we have the privilege of serving uh, El Mensaje. And uh, it's been a joy. It's been an honor. Uh, it's been real uh, to serve in El Mensaje for the last uh, three years. Uh, and so uh, I think it's now a little tradition. I get to come the weekend where the leaders are out of town. Uh, so it makes me feel like a leader in the, in the South Bay Church or something, you know? And so uh, for a weekend, we get to be El Mensaje South Bay. Uh, and so that's encouraging. Um, but anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I really want to share uh, some of the things that God has been uh, doing and some of the plans that or dreams that we have here moving forward uh, a little bit with uh, El Mensaje and Coastal LA and different things like that. As of now, everything I'm going to share is more of a, a dream, a vision. Uh, we're praying for it. And so we are beginning to uh, uh, begin conversations as we move forward uh, as El Mensaje uh, Church here within, within South Bay. All are great things. So you're in a sermon series called Mythbusters. Uh, today's topic... Um, which I thought it was uh, interesting that I was given this topic. It kind of landed, right? No one gave it to me, but perhaps God, that Christianity, the myth that Christianity is an American faith. Uh, and so let's bring the foreigner to talk about that, uh, you know, <coughs> which I think is actually pretty fitting. Uh, amen. Though I'm not really a foreigner, you know what I'm saying? I'm as American as American you can be. Uh, so... Anyway, but uh, so I have a couple of introductions here. We have four introductions here for you today. Uh, one, obviously, we'll talk about our theme for today, uh, this myth that Christianity is an American faith. Also want to introduce to you a little bit of what's happening in El Mensaje. Want to talk to you also about Summer Challenge. That's a, our L.A. campus ministry uh, has done summer challenges for the last two years. Uh, and this year they visited... Uh, churches in Mexico, specifically in the Guadalajara. Uh, they also visited churches in the Middle East, and another group visited uh, churches in Manila. Uh, and so I want to share with you a little bit about that. Amen? Because sometimes we can get a little isolated, and we forget that we're part of a global movement. Uh, we forget that we're part of such a great, uh, diverse uh, uh, congregation here in Los Angeles. And South Bay not having a huge campus ministry nearby or college nearby, uh, you know, sometimes we can miss out on what God is doing. But a lot of our kids are heading in that direction. And so it's important for you to know what the college ministry, what the campus ministry uh, is up to. And then I also want to introduce to you uh, some of the themes in the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And then we're going to land and hopefully we were inspired by something here, uh, interrupted. Uh, by all of these introductions. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, I've got a couple introductions here. So we're going to start with El Mensaje. Uh, as I shared with you, you know, El Mensaje was planted seven years ago. In fact, uh, uh, at the end of the month here, it turns seven years. Uh, my wife and I were compelled to uh, leave the English ministry to go serve this underserved ministry uh, because a lot of people were not coming to church because of language. And so we chose that name. The church was already there, and so we were able to partner with the, the group that was already there. Uh, and so we are in our seventh year as a church. Tina and I, has been, it's been three years. And before we landed in El Mensaje, we did a little, uh, a little survey. We, we, we studied out why is there not enough Spanish ministries in the United States. As of right now, there's still only 10 ministries with a full-time minister devoted to Spanish ministry in the entire fellowship, in our fellowship in the United States. Uh, two of us of the 10 are here in coastal LA. Uh, five of us of the 10 are here in LA. And so my position does not exist in Northern California, Arizona, Texas, Nevada, 
Uh, and so there are ministries there, but not with a full-time minister. Some of them will never have a full-time minister. Some of them may not even need a full-time minister. So there are pockets there where the church is providing the needs for those around them. Amen? Uh, one of the myths is we can ask around and say, well, who needs a Spanish ministry? I don't think none of us would raise our hands. But the question is, who's not coming to church because of language? And those are millions. And so Spanish ministry is a specialized mission ministry, language-based uh, ministry. Amen? Now, our mission field is changing in West L.A., The Spanish-speaking communities are moving out of Venice, and that's a nice way of putting it. Santa Monica, and now with the stadium coming, Inglewood is also going to be making a huge changes we foresee. And so our future in El Mensaje, we see that it's somewhere in the South Bay area, uh, still with an emphasis on the west side, but more in the South Bay area, and will probably become we estimate uh, more of a bilingual ministry where we still keep the focus and the mission for the Spanish speakers to come in and make the church their home, but their kids are not Spanish speakers. And so we wanna make sure that we uh, become what the community, the community needs, amen? And so we're hoping to be close neighbors to you and perhaps more. We also discovered that Spanish ministry usually don't pass the 10-year mark. And anytime there's crisis in the ch church, the first ministry to go is Spanish ministry. And there's good reasons why. I mean, it's not, a, it's not good that it has to go, but there's logical reasons as to, as to why. You wouldn't want to cut your youth minister. I wouldn't. Or your campus minister. I wouldn't. And so it's always competing for resources. And also it doesn't have a lot of people that want to go participate in that ministry or lead in that ministry. And so passing the 10 year mark is very important. And so we're in year seven. We're not over that hump yet. In fact, the next three years will determine much of the future of El Mensaje. And so we know you love us. We want to encourage you to keep praying for us as we are trying to navigate through the changing times, but adjust to what the Holy Spirit is doing because we want to secure a healthy future for the Spanish or bilingual ministry here at Mensaje. But we have three long years to go. Amen? Amen. One of the things that we need in the near future, and this is not a call to action, I'm informing you as I'm gonna to begin to inform the region, it's part of my responsibility to El Mensaje, is one of the things that we uh, have lacked is that when you have established ministries in the English ministry, what you know and what you've experienced is so valuable. And so if you take that and go serve in a small growing church, you provide so much. And so the challenge for us that in the last seven years, a couple from the English ministry, only three couples have come to serve in El Mensaje. And those three couples, one of them is Tina and I. And so we have lacked the mature season experience couple that has witness in English ministry and is now planting some of those principles and resources in Spanish ministry. Hope that makes sense. And so we're looking forward to that being a possible solution, but we, my wife and I also see it as in addition to more friends to serve alongside us. Uh, and so we're beginning to do, we want to do it right. We want to talk to everyone uh, and wait on God to determine those plans. Uh, amen? amen. So that is a little bit where El Mensaje is. Summer Challenge, the campus ministry, is where historically our leaders, uh, our ministers were converted. Many of you were converted in campus ministry or youth ministry. And so the campus ministry is so important to the present and the future 
of our fellowship. And for us as parents, we are cheering on the campus ministry because our kids are going to go into those ministries, but also those are going to be our kids' leaders, peers. And so it's so important for us to connect and support what they're doing. And what they're doing is great, amazing things. And so they started a summer challenge where campus students basically get a call, whoever wants to go somewhere in the world for three weeks to go serve the church there and go share our faith there, raise your own money, sign up, convince your parents if they're scared, (laughs) and we'll go. And so a group of people, uh, disciples there from the campus ministry traveled throughout the Middle East connecting with your brothers and sisters in the Middle East. And so for an American Christian to travel through the Middle East, that has been life changing. Uh, Some of the people that were there, your kids, former South Bay members were part of that mission field. Another group went to the Philippines uh, where they connected with the churches there and shared their faith on campus had a lot of Bible studies, but came back with a different faith. And a group of people went to Guadalajara, uh, Mexico. Guadalajara is broken into three churches, and they disciple four other churches in four neighboring states. And so, obviously, one of those states is Nayarit. That's the state where I was from. I'm in the peak Nayarit. That's where I was born. And so I have family there, and we have a small church there that just turns 10 years, in fact. And I've shared before, you know, I've had an immigration case of 17 years, which I want to thank you for your support and your prayers, because God has granted us victory in that. Uh, And so we, uh, that, that, that burden of uncertainty of what's going to happen to our family and our future is gone. And the blessing to be able to travel, uh, we have now attained that because of God. And so my wife and I joined the mission team there for a weekend. Uh, we traveled outside of the country for the first time together. And so we landed there on Thursday. We stayed with the church Uh, visited the church. We did a workshop on youth and family for the Guadalajara Church on Saturday. I was able to worship with them uh, Sunday morning. And after church on Sunday, we rented a car and drove three hours from the distance of L.A. to San Diego to Tepic, where I'm from, where Tina got to meet my family for the first time. (laughs) And here we are in Un Cerro in Tepic, Uh, some of my members of the family there. And so um, I experienced a a miracle that my wife and my family were able to meet for the first first time. It was so difficult to imagine that and to be able to live it out. I just, I had to take note, okay, Martin, this is a God moment. Do not forget what God can do. We also I uh, had a little carne asada, of course, and so we invited the church leaders from Tepic to the carne asada, uh, and here they are with their two daughters, who are uh, now disciples, and there we are having a dinner with the missionaries, my family, and Tina. <laughs> and I was like, this is God right here. It took 17 years, but it was worth it. A longing has been fulfilled and has given us a tree of life of faith. Uh, Amen. And so uh, I love this picture here with my grandma. Uh, Amen. And so, but the team, you know, they were there for three weeks. They share their faith constantly. And so now they're sending us, that's uh, Frank, that's the church. They're sending us pictures of all the people that the campus students met who are now studying the Bible. One of them is an amateur uh, boxer. Uh, who actually won a knockout uh, first round yesterday, but him and his brother are studying the Bible. All kinds of other young men and women are studying the Bible because the campus students were there for three weeks. One of their teens was baptized during the time there, a teen that was already studying the Bible, but seeing that the church is bigger than her city and her family and seeing disciples of all colors 
be part of the church and connect so easily because disciples are disciples. Moved her heart. Where she, that was what she needed to see. This is beyond my family. This is a calling from God. And so we had a little uh, dinner afterwards to kind of download what were your findings uh, while you were there. And the reason we are praying, it's in the, the introduction here, is we want to establish what we're going to call Puente International. And that means that we want to figure out a way where El Mensaje, San Diego, Coastal LA, the campus ministries can partner with the churches in Guadalajara, Colima, Zacatecas, Tepic, and Leon, where we can visit these churches every year till Jesus comes back. And the reason why is we don't want to just go somewhere and have an experience that we never return again and ends up just becoming an adventure. We want to have an experience that becomes a re an ongoing relationship. And I think for us as American disciples, we need to connect with the faith of the global south. And I'll explain a little bit what that term means. All right, let's introduce here Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote, wrote the book of Acts. Why is it important? Because we're going to go to read right now, Acts 15 and 16, and learn about this woman's faith. Her name is Lydia. But Luke deals with, a lot of the themes in Luke are social justice themes. In Luke, the hated Samaritans are the heroes of faith. In Luke, the protagonists of the introduction of Luke are women of faith. When you look at the introduction of Matthew, the protagonist in that introduction is Joseph and his faith and his righteousness. In Luke, the protagonist is Mary and Elizabeth. For its time, for a written account to have a woman be the protagonist of the introduction was radical, different, unique. So the angel appears to Zechariah. Zechariah does not believe, yet Elizabeth believes immediately. Mary immediately submits to the God's will and wants to participate in God's life and God's plan. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, the women run to the tomb after the resurrection. The men run home. And so the women are the first ones to proclaim the good news that Jesus is risen. And so the Gospel of Luke highlights the faith of women. It doesn't criticize men. Don't get me wrong. But it highlights the faith of women. It highlights the value of the participation of women of faith in God's community. For its time, it was completely a radical idea. And so we, we see these themes of women of faith throughout the book of Luke and, and Acts. But we also see themes of social justice. So we come back around here. And our theme is <coughs> the myth that Christianity is an American faith. There's a lot of things that I can say that could go totally wrong right here. So there's a couple of boundaries that we're going to have here. This isn't a criticism of any kind. I think it's important for us to discover what Christianity really is. Christianity is a borderless faith. It's a borderless religion. Christianity at the moment is the largest religion in the world. And so for us to understand what's happening, we're going to use these terms that have different meanings, but the meaning here, we're going to keep it in the context of faith. You have the global north, and then you have the global south what could be called as a third world. Most Christians today live in the global south. In our fellowship of churches, the churches that are growing or thriving live in the global 
south. They live in communities that were the most affected through colonial reign. A lot of them are discovering the scriptures for the first time. And they have great, unique insights that some of us would not gather those insights if we read those scriptures because the context that we live in in the global north is very different. Persecution, famine, oppression is more common there. And so the Bible breathes new life in ways that we will never feel unless we're in those situations. And so their faith is so unique and it's growing. And Christianity is ending, decreasing in the global north. Some say we're in the post-Christian era. That may be true for the global north, but not for the global south. And we've seen how uh, establishments that provided faith are ending in the United States. Some of us are still grieving those losses. Some of us are fighting to get those structures back. The reality is, I don't think they're going to come back. And I think it's good for the church. Because if the church needs to rely on establishments to have faith, that's a bad place to be for a church. The church always did very poorly when it aligned itself to empires or colonial powers. They ended up abusing others or themselves, lost their identity. Yet the church always did well when it was purified through the fires of persecution. The church always did well when it was marginalized and served in humiliation because they were serving all for the glory of God. And so what a unique time that we live in. Where established Christianity is fading, but true, genuine Christianity is going to grow more than ever before. So what do we need? We need to imitate the faith of the global south. What happens when our kids go to Hope Youth Corps and they travel places in the global south? What happens to them when they come back? My life has changed. Why? They participated in the life of God in a context of poverty and oppression. So we, as American Christians, we send our kids to the global south to have an experience with God. The global south sends their kids in desperation to the global north. And how the global north responds to those crises says a lot about the faith and Christianity of the global north. So how do we process that irony that we send our kids to the global south to experience God and yet we have a difficulty figuring out what to do when they and their need send their kids to the global north? How do we process that irony? there what does it say and so what is God doing God is shaking things up and we get to participate in that let's go to Acts chapter 15 God is shaking things up and that's so, or sort of the themes in Luke in Acts social justice changes God is constantly surprising the church. When Jesus raises from the dead, they want Jesus to come back and be there for them physically. And Jesus is like, don't even hold on to me. Don't even hug me. Don't cling to me. We're doing something new. You see, human nature is the disciples, they wanted to go back to the first three years of Jesus. But Jesus is saying, those three years have ended. These next three years, these next 30 years, are going to be very unique. And so they had a hard time adjusting to those changes, but they ended up participating with God, and those changes were amazing, and they kept being surprised along the way. One of those surprises is that now the Gentiles, 
non-Jews were becoming Christians. And they were becoming Christians in greater number than the Jewish communities. And so the established leadership there in Jerusalem, they're like, what do we do? Because a group of people, a group of the Jewish Christians were saying, we need to make sure we enforce these Jewish values onto these new Christians. Basically, they need to be more Jewish in order to be real Christians. And a group of people were like, that sounds crazy. It's kind of logical, but no, that doesn't seem to be what God is doing. We cannot impose our culture on others. The gospel needs to grow in every culture. And so God even had to convert Peter in Acts 10, where he witnessed that the same thing that happened to them in Acts 2 as Jewish Christians was happening to a Gentile, Cornelius, in Acts 10. And so in that situation, wrongly misunderstood many times, But Peter is converted there. Converted to what? God accepts the Gentiles. So come Acts 15. This is the tension that's happening in the church. And in verse 6, chapter 15, the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us, Acts 10, Acts 2. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. They they did not need to go through rituals. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the next of the Gentiles, of the Gentiles, a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent and, li- and silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And so they finalize by saying, God is doing something unique and let's accept it. Let's participate in that. God is saving everyone. And so they put together a letter, a decree to say, this is the only thing we are expecting from the new Gentile Christians. And so then they sent Paul and Barnabas to go tell this, that, those news to the rest of the churches And so now they're traveling in all kinds of different communities, establishing the message that unified them, but they remain so diverse in their cultures, in their languages. It's such a beautiful scene, such a beautiful time. In that global perspective, I think a lot of our kids need because they could just view Christianity as your family, your church, and they live in a context of their high school and their friends not seeing that God is a God, a global God doing amazing and great things all throughout the world, which is why when our kids are able to see what God is doing all throughout the world, they obtain a faith that is unique to them now, that is personal to them now. Their eyes are open and they're able to see this is at the end of the day about God and what God is doing and less to do with what my family is doing. And so this is amazing times. And so we continue in Acts 16. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewish and a believer but whose father was a Greek The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area, for they all had knew that his father was a Greek. So they still had to adjust, but for unique circumstances. And that's all we'll say about that. (laughs) Verse 4, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem, what we had just talked about, for the people to obey. 
So the churches were strengthened in what? In the faith and grew daily in numbers. The fact that the established Jewish church in Jerusalem was able to connect with the Gentile churches, the Bible says, what did it do? It strengthened their faith. Do we need our faith strengthened? What would be of our faith if we allow the global south faith to influence our global north faith? Because we've always seen it the other way. We've always seen it that we're the missionaries, that we need to help the poor global south. And yet the gospel is growing there more than here. So what if we allow ourselves to be influenced by the faith of the global south what would that do for our faith we know what it's doing to our kids when they travel there what if we all allow that faith to impact us our faith will grow our numbers will grow in verse 6 Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Many questions there. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Many more questions there. So they passed to Mysia and went through down to Tro Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we, because Luke is now with them, got ready at once to leave to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So now we, we just talked about the whole global perspective. Let's talk about our perspective here now. So Paul, after they deliver these messages, they're like, you know what, let's go visit these other churches. And when you're around disciples, and you're participating in the life of God, you want to participate more in the life of God. And so they said, let's go share our faith where it hasn't been shared. Really? We don't have any money for it? Let's just go. And these brothers are like, let's go. And then what happened? God prevented them from entering those towns or preventing them from establishing a church there can you imagine how they felt? Confused, angry. How do you feel when you have great intentions of faith? You do all the protocols. I got input. I got advice. I got a plan. I've communicated. I'm excited about it. I mean, I have faith in it. And then it just doesn't work out. Has that ever happened? <laughs> How do you respond? Like, really, how do you respond? Disillusion? I mean, I blame God, but then I can't blame God. <laughs> so I'm already confused. <laughs> Depending on your personality, you might blame others. Yeah. Depending on your personality, you might blame yourself. It's my faith. I need to more. Of, you know. <laughs> We've all been disillusioned by having great plans and intentions. I'll say this, church. Here's a preacher in me. Some of us are still in that place. You're disillusioned by the failures of the past, and you're stuck. Get unstuck. Amen. That was a confusing time for the mission team. Maybe Paul was like, maybe I'm not the right leader for them. Maybe someone was like, why is Paul leading? <laughs> I don't know. People turn on each other. You know what I mean? This was a good plan, and we're, we like, don't like each other anymore. <laughs> but that night, Paul has a vision from a man in Macedonia saying, help us! Can you imagine that morning? We already talked about how they probably felt. That morning, Paul wakes up after some chilaquiles. <laughs> and he just says, hey, guys, uh, I had a vision last night in Macedonia to the place we've never been. I mean, nothing we've done in the last month, few months has worked, but I just had a vision last night that we should go where we've never gone before. 
Can you imagine what the group's response would be? Well, we know what it was. They started packing up. That's the point. Don't get stuck by the failures of the past that prevent you from continuing forward in the life that God has planned for you. Let those failures go. They already taught you what they've taught you, but they should not determine you. So they were not critical with Paul. They said, let's do it. There's a new vision. Amen. Let's go. And so they packed and they went. To what? To a vision of someone in need. This was the most discouraging time of their faith, and yet they made bold decisions of faith based on a vision. And they did it together. It's been the sermon that I've been sat here for a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and so we come to this woman, Lydia. Let's read about her. Verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. There's a theme. One of those listening was a woman of the city of Tyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, they invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So they travel and they travel and they travel. And so here's a little map of where they, where they were. That's the area where they tried to share and they just could not. And that was a couple months of failure. So then they traveled here to Troas, Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi. And that's where we find ourselves. They had never entered this area. This is the beginning of the continent of Europe. Paul enters Europe for the first time. From the global south to the global north. And what does he find there? Not much in Neapolis, but at Philippi, during the Sabbath day, their costume was, let's go share our faith at the synagogue. But there is no synagogue in Philippi. This is new for them. We're in a place where it has no synagogue. We just established that the Gentiles are part, but now we're experiencing something unique, really, in the all Gentile world. And they adjust to what God was doing. We got to be good to adjust. Amen? Amen? In our culture, things are changing so fast. It doesn't mean we are changing. We are adjusting to maintain our faith and our values, but to not build walls that keeps people out, but to build bridges and nets to help others. That's why we need a Spanish ministry in the U.S. Spanish ministry is not the boat. It's the net that brings people into the boat. And so they're now in Philippi. It was one of the customs that in order to have a synagogue, you needed 10 faithful Jewish men. Why is there no synagogue here? Because the brothers didn't organize. But what do the women do? They can't build a synagogue, but they still love God, so they go find a place of prayer outside of the city during the Sabbath. So Paul goes there. And there he finds Lydia, a woman who worshiped God. We know she's wealthy. We know that even though she had the money and the resources, she didn't spend it on herself or pleasures. She loved God. 
and she found the Jewish God unique to all these other gods. And so she's hanging out with the Jewish women on the Sabbath. The Jewish women on the Sabbath don't even respond to Paul's message. It was the Gentile woman who responded to Paul's message. And she's the first baptism in Europe. The first convert of Europe was a woman, a Gentile woman. The beginning of the church in Philippi. Isn't that exciting? What is God showing about you, sister? How valuable your faith is. Without your generosity, that's one of the qualities I think you bring, one of many, the church can't move forward. In a marriage couple, if the sister's not generous, it's a tough, generous couple. (laughs) But when the sister's generous, it's a generous couple. You have that value, sister. I see people elbowing each other. (laughs) That means it's a good sermon. (laughs) What else did we learn? Where is she from? Tyatira. Where's Tyatira? What? We tried to share there. And God said no. And we were so frustrated, so disillusioned, and we had this crazy vision, and we said, let's just go. And now that we get here, we haven't found anyone open but one person, and you happen to be from the place that we tried to enter. What? <laughs> and so we have the first convert in Europe, a woman, a Gentile, an immigrant. God is continuing to surprise Paul and the apostles. Let's let God continue to surprise us. That these connections, these international connections build our faith. I believe as Coastal LA, we need Puente International. We need an established relationship so that we can learn from the faith of our brothers and sisters. At the moment, we may not have much to give, though we do but we have a lot more to receive. We're in need of faith, are we not? And maybe we need their faith more than they need our faith. Maybe they need our resources, but we need their their faith, and I think that's a fair exchange. So what do we learn? Years later, in Revelation 2, the angel of God is talking to seven churches. One of those churches is the church in Tyatira. Wow. I want to imagine that Lydia, in her joy of finding the true God and the complete gospel, because she already worshiped God, but she didn't have the complete gospel. She had an incomplete version, and then she got the full version with Jesus, then got baptized. Because you can worship God and not be saved. That's what's happening. And she worshiped God and then she was saved. I want to imagine that she, in her joy, we see her hospitality, we see her generosity here, persuading people because she wants to give to them. I believe, I want to imagine that she's like, do we have a church back home? No, we actually couldn't there. How can I fund a church back home? And somehow, years later, her hometown has a church. And years later in Acts 2, the church isn't doing that well, but there is a church. Needs to repent. It probably did. I don't know. But she was part of establishing the church back home. Even though God brought her to Europe, God converted her in Europe to have a dream for her hometown. And so we see God just shifting and changing people all over the globe not for a political thing but for a God thing, a God kingdom thing, a salvation thing and as disciples we need to be aware of that, that Christianity is not an American faith but Christianity is a global faith with a global God a borderless faith for all people where all cultures 
can thrive. That's what we are a part of. And that's what I think as American Christians, we need more of faith from the global, the global South. So Lydia is an international bridge. We also can be part of international bridges, Puente International, where these connections and we exchange our faith with each other. For many of us, like me, God brought us here to be saved. Right? What are we going to do with that? Will we be like Lydia and dream about others? I think we should. I think we can. I think we owe it to God. We owe it to the churches. And I think that's a value that we bring to the fellowship that we're a part of here in the United States. And our U.S. fellowship, which we're a part of, loves that and wants that and has historically supported that. Two of 10 Spanish ministries are here in coastal LA. That says a lot about you, coastal LA. That says a lot about us. Let's continue this participation in God's salvation of all people. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and say a prayer, and we're going to take communion. I want to encourage you to think about this. Do we need to learn faith from the global south? What can we gain if we allow ourselves to be influenced by the new faith that is found in the global south? What does God want? And I believe that is one of the reasons Jesus died, to connect people all over the world. We just read that scripture in Revelation 7 during the worship. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we're so grateful that you continually interrupt us as you interrupted and surprised our brothers and sisters in the scriptures. You continue to surprise us now. Help us, God, to not be stuck in the wounds and the failures of the past, but help us to be able to move forward and participate in your activity in your life here in the present and in the future. Thank you for the privilege that we live on to be able to travel, to be able to visit other churches, to be able to send our kids, sponsor our kids. We are gaining so much from that. What we've gained there, help us to bring it home and live it out, not individually, but as a church. We're grateful that you died and rose from the dead to call us to a life where you lead us, where you surprise us where you invite us to participate in your salvation plan to all the world. Open our eyes to see the greatness of your global plan. We love you, God. We remember the death and resurrection. We examine our minds, but we also pray to participate in your future, that we can allow our brothers and sisters in the global south to influence our faith more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, give it up for Martin one more time. Amen. It's amazing. I don't know about you, but when I hear Martin, it's like a scariness that comes. Like it's like a, I always feel called higher, you know. And um, it's just I wrote down here. Doesn't he want to make you just like jump on a plane? Just grab your Bible, jump on a plane, and just say, "Come on, let's go somewhere." You know what I'm saying? It's so ex it's so exciting to hear uh, Martin. It's very special to have that. Um, especially such a treat uh, once a year to have him come on down. He's, you know, and this is definitely home. He's done, uh, served so many ways with the teen ministry back here. He's got such a great history here of helping so many children, but uh, his faith to serve is incredible. And so thank you so much for that, Martin. Um, I do believe, I just wrote down here, El Mensaje, that Martin is, uh, it's amazing that his, his ministry is called El Mensaje because I, I, I feel like that personally. He's always got a special message to bring with him. And so 
really convicted by that. The lesson, even just starting out with the uh, global map of the north and the south, and uh, looking at that and thinking about um, even in, in Europe or different places where you see like old churches and things like that, and you think they'd have more faith instead of become like tourist spots and the things that go on in the global, like Instagram, Instagram spots, right, or different things like that, but global south and the, and the needs and the faith and the things that they can provide. It's just amazing the way you started that lesson, Martina. I just want to thank you so much for your faith. Um, and I'll do it in Spanish as well. Gracias por, por, uh, por tu fe. Gracias por tener el corazón de llevar tu familia, servir en el oeste, parte de Los Ángeles. Gracias por todos los sacrificios. Yo sé que es muchos sacrificios para hacer eso con tu familia, el matrimonio. Pero gracias, hermano. Tienes un corazón bien grande. Gracias por venir, regresar aquí a South Bay y compartir tu corazón. So thank you. Let's thank him once again. Amen. Woo. Amen for the offering. Um, yeah, it was funny. Um, I'll do the offering part right now. Uh, Brian, uh, if you know anything about teaching, we're like on a 10 month. I'm a teacher, okay? I'm a fourth grade teacher in Long Beach. My name is Rick Horta, by the way, if you don't know me. But, um, and uh, it gets pretty dry in this last week of August. You know, you start thinking of finances. We're like on a 10 month calendar pay and stuff like that. But over the years, you know how to work it. You save your summer savings and all of that. And I, I'm not complaining, I've been blessed, amen, by the grace of God, amen. But, you know, you think August gets kind of a little like you go, oh my gosh, okay, that first paycheck comes, I work September, I get a small one, end of September, and then the bigger one comes in October. And then as soon as I was thinking this, you know, Brian's, I'm thinking all these finances, thinking like, okay, I got to take, I got to stretch everything I got here in August, you know. And then Brian calls, and I'm thinking of all the problems, right, I'm thinking of all the finances and stuff like that. Hey, bro, can you do the offering? Like, that's when the text, I was like, <laughs> like oh man okay amen yeah sure you know let's do it uh and i share that in a sense because god is always taking care of me whatever your thing is with with uh you know the the tithing or the giving that it is a sacrifice it is a gift to god amen and it is part of your worship and uh god i heard uh many of you know brian plymel you know just something with, uh, just something that if you stick to a conviction like for me it's always it was always like even from my back in my campus days or uh, singles or whatever. I mean, there was always like either my rent or my mortgage and then whatever I give to God monthly, like, and there's some temptations. I'm sharing that in a sense of like, um, there are some things that I want. Like I went, I, mean, I know I'll go all over the place, but there's, everybody know what an Airstream is? Airstream camper? Okay. That's like my desire. Like I want that, you know? And so, uh, but in my mind and in my heart, you know, I've always had a conviction like, man, I can't pay, I can't have a car payment greater than what I give to God monthly. Like, it's my living here in the United States. And then the next thing, like, it would be on my conscience. Like, I can't do that. And right now, my, my heart's been on an airstream. Like, I, I can do that and I can go, I just want to go up the one, keep going, you know, go to Oregon, Washington, Canada, come back around down Idaho. Like, that's what I want to do and I'll be happy, you know, and um. I'm just being open about that, amen. I, you, whatever your thing is, whatever your desire is, you know, whatever your thing is. But I know that my conviction has always been like I can't get, I can't, I can't make a payment more than what I give to God a month. And God has always taken care of me. God has always just blessed my family, blessed my life. And I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I just that's a conviction that I heard. And it's like it's kept me safe in some way. So whatever it is for you, it's a time of giving. It's a time of offering. I just want to share a scripture of, in Proverbs 18. 15, it says, the heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. And then in 16, it says, a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. And I think that that's exactly what giving is. It ushers you, guides you to the presence of the great. You know, we, we heard that song, How Great Is Our God, right? And in your heart, or whether you do it physically, we raise our hands, you know, how great is our God, you know? He's, he's amazing. Um, and when it comes to giving, though, I just, I just want to make sure that that gift that you give, as the scripture says, it opens the way to his, in your presence of him. He's the one that's great. And it's for you. It's kind of like sometimes when you, we don't meet all the needs when we meet somebody needy in, on the street or whatever sometimes. But, some, you know, sometimes I realize, man, that was more an opportunity for me than it was for that person. Does that make sense? And so that's what I want to reflect on. It's really the gift. It's for your hearts, you know. 
it's meeting the needs. I appreciate the Global South map as well. It's kind of like, yeah, we give, but really, we grow in our faith. Amen? We grow in so many ways closer to God in that sense. And I just want to, I want to just make you aware of that. I want you to, as a visual, as a teacher, I give a visual. Amen? So I'm going to give a visual, like, and I'll just say, just to teach the point. But, you know, if you were my class, I would say, like, you know, we put our hands or our hearts in the air. How great is our God? Well, I just want to make sure that now you don't put them down in your pockets. Does that make sense? And so that's what I would teach. It's like, make sure, man, we stay right here. We stay, man, how great is our God? And that's part of a worship. And I'm not talking about an amount. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm just talking about your heart and making a lifelong decision and giving and it being part of our hearts. Amen? Amen. So let's say a prayer for the offering. I think the, oh, no, I got some announcements. Let's pray for the offering first. And then uh, I'll say some announcements here. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for just an opportunity to give, God. We remember you, Father. Um, God, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out. God, thank you so much for our church and its sacrifices all around the world, God. And grateful for uh, just to hear Martin, God, and think about how much uh, many needs that we don't even see, whether it's staff, uh, God, behind the scenes, it's a need in the church, it's a church need in the South, God, in the global South, whatever it might be, God. We, I don't know, God, I don't know all exactly uh, how the money works and all that. All I know is my relationship with you, God, and I know that, uh, God, it's part of my worship, God. I just pray that each and every one of us can um, really think about that when it comes to sacrificing, really think about what you've done in our lives, God, you are faithful, and God, we give a gift, God, to be in your presence. When we want to be ushered into your greatness, God. We want to be ushered into your heart, God, and know you deeper, God, and God, sacrifice is a part of that. God, if we knew the answers to everything, where everything went, God, it's, we would probably hold back in so many ways, God, but God, we love you, and we thank you, and we trust you. You're an amazing God, God. You're the lamb above all lambs, God. You're an amazing God. We sing that song. And you are great, and we want to be there, God, with you. Thank you so much for every heart in here that has sacrificed over the many, many years. Thank you for the young hearts that are learning about it, God, and learning how to uh, just make that change in their lives, God. Thank you for anybody visiting that's been moved and touched and trying to figure out a way of like, man, I'd love to give more, God. Thank you for everyone, everyone here that in their faith and wherever they're at. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I got some announcements. Um... So next Sunday, we have, a luau, uh, we have a luau at the Seaside Lagoon at 6 p.m. So I don't have a date on that. Can somebody give me, is it the 26th, right? 26th. So at 6 p.m., we will be at the Seaside Lagoon. We will not be here at Miracosta. Um, so it's a potluck, swimming and fellowship, and then worship. So get there. If I remember the announcement from last time, we got the entire place to ourselves lifeguards until the sun goes down, I believe. Um, so if you want your kiddos, you know, to swim, don't show up there at 830 or 827 or whatever time the sun sets on your phone, you, you see it or whatever. Get there at 6, you know, enjoy the great time of swimming and while the lifeguard's there. And then we'll go into worship. I believe there's going to be a movie afterwards. It'll be a great time. So um, just as a quick reminder, I'd like everybody to do one of these. Tell a neighbor right now, luau next week. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, luau next week. All right? Amen. Amen. A reminder to register for the women's retreat. Uh, she Laughs is the title of that. And um, so just a reminder, I know the price will go up on a certain date. Anybody have that date? The 24th, it goes up in price, $10, so save your $10, and, um, you know, amen. A little bit more gas money to get up there, but have a great time to uh, uh, register and get out to the women's retreat. And at this time, um, we want to have Abby Hood, is she behind me somewhere, coming in to share about her Hope for Kids Leadership Academy serving in Philadelphia for five weeks. So let's give it up for Abby Hood. Like Rick said, I'm Abby Hood. 
Um, I'm from the Yams Ministry, the Young Adults Ministry. Uh, I'm 18. I actually just graduated high school. Um, and I have been a disciple for three years uh, since March 1st, 2015. <laughs> um, and this summer, thanks to many of your generous donations, I was able to go to a life-changing experience called Hefla. Um, and I'm just going to share a quick scripture. In Matthew 13, 44, um, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Um, so for those who don't know, HEFCLA stands for Hope for Kids Leadership Academy. And it is basically a five-week-long spiritual boot camp <laughs> um, where uh, uh, at Camp Hope for Get Kids in, in Philadelphia, where you push yourself in a multitude of ways. <laughs> um, each week is something different. So we have um, Evangelism Week where we shared our faith on the Drexel and UPenn campuses, uh, Crew Week, which is a lot of manual labor, um, serving food, painting bridges, uh, uh, moving these nasty wet logs across <laughs> the place, um, and the like. Uh, Teen Camp Counseling Week, I um, had a co-counselor and we had nine amazing, uh, wonderful campers. Um, MTA, which is Ministry Training Academy, um, where we spend eight hours a day learning, um, uh, dissecting, and, and discussing the Bible. Uh, and then uh, Camp Miracles, which is a camp for the inner city kids of Philadelphia where we come and mentor them. Uh, I don't think I have worked so hard in my life uh, <laughs> and pushed myself to uh, the breaking point and um, served with so much of myself while fully being aware that it wasn't out of my power, that it was all God's. Um, I also never bonded so closely and vulnerably with such a large group of people. We had 38 people on my track, um, 26 were girls, 12 were boys. Um, and I made these lifelong friendships uh, with people I had never even met before. Um, in fact, the one time that I had this mental breakdown was in front of everyone when I had to say goodbye to all these beautiful and amazing people. Um, who had made such a huge impact on my life. Uh, while I was there, I didn't really think I was going to grow. I went in saying that, like, I hope something changes because I don't know if it will. Um, and I didn't really see any growth or change in myself um, until I got on the plane to leave, and I realized that I didn't want to let all these things that I had learned there go to waste. Um, so things that I learned from Hefka were that cockroaches can fly, so <laughs> that was um, <laughs> so scary. Uh, they come in the cabin and like hang out with you. Uh, <laughs> that uh, I learned that God gives me my energy and my power. That there are faithful, God-fearing brothers who are attractive, but that does not mean <laughs> that I need a boyfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I learned that perseverance is a skill that I would love to master. I learned to dream for my friends and my family, especially the people in my ministry. Um, I learned that it's really important to see all people as not just people on the street, but people that haven't seen God's kingdom and that they are God's children. Um, I learned that I'm an adult and I need to start acting like it. Uh, I learned that women make incredibly strong leaders. Uh, we all got put in a room together to plan a brother's encouragement night, and let me tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done because everybody wants to voice their opinion, and they're all great opinions. Um, <laughs> I also learned to act on motivation. Um, I learned that women were actually able to prophesy back in the day in the Bible, um, and that means a lot. Uh, I learned that God's kingdom and God's people are a precious, precious treasure that I would like to hold on to for forever. Thank you so much for letting me share. All right, everyone stand up. We're going to have one more song.
All right, everybody has to move. You can't just stand still now. Lord, your love has saved us. Lord, your love has saved us. Precious blood has bathed us. Precious blood has bathed us. Now your message takes us. Now your message takes us. All around the world. All around the world. Can't you hear them? Hear them singing. The people them rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing, hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise is heard around the world. All of your creation, all of your creation, each and every. 